Good afternoon and welcome to the Gulf Intelligence Two Minute Warning feature interview series, where every week we take a deeper dive into the trends and topics uh, uh, impacting the global energy transition. And today we're honored to be joined by Christina Haverkamp, who is the Managing Director of the German Energy Agency. Welcome, Christina. Uh, welcome to our table. Well, thanks a lot, Sean, for having me. It's nice to have the chance to speak together again, uh, as we very much enjoyed your participation in our forum in January. Uh, and um, a lot has changed in those six months. I mean, more than any of us can Im could have ever imagined at the time. But at the time, uh, Christina, the energy transition in January looked like it was very much 2020 would be the year for uh, the crystallization of the energy transition with the Paris Climate Agreement coming on and other big uh, signature moments. Uh, but now we got COVID. What's your assessment of the momentum of the energy transition coming uh, through the COVID pandemic? Well, indeed, uh, COVID has taken the place um, in terms of urgency, in terms of public attention of climate change. Um, however, at the same moment, my impression is that uh, um, COVID has made people very aware of the vulnerability of our global system. And it has made them aware of the way that um, supply chains interact, that um, certain actions such as transportation impact on climate, et cetera, et cetera. So um, at least in Germany, it is quite clear that uh, while the first great recession we had in 2009 um, impacted especially our youth, in a way that they turned more inward, became more materialistic. This appears to impact them in a way that they are becoming, even the conservative ones, becoming more conscious of the need to, to have a social model that is both sustainable and resilient. And I find that a very promising development, which we can witness here. At the same time that the COVID has created this conscious awareness, it's also uh, delivered the, uh, or played a part, not exclusively, but played a very big part in delivering a very, uh, a collapse in oil and gas prices, fossil fuel, carbon. Uh, and so the, the challenge that that would be to the energy transition, the commitment to, to stay the course, when fossil fuels, again, are quite competitively and cheap, relatively cheap, one would have to say. Uh, what's your own interpretation of that? How, is that a challenge to the momentum of the transition? Um, it is, of course, clear that consumption is up to a certain point dependent on price. And we had this great slump of oil and gas prices which however was also due to the fact that there was no demand <laughs> because uh, um, of the lockdown, um, no production, much less transport. So people just, uh, our businesses, national economies didn't need oil and gas. Also, of course, there was a factor of fair or unfair competition of Iran and Nigeria in particular. Uh, maybe producing a little more than their share, which also had an impact of pri on prices. But um, at least in Europe, um, the discussion about um, the share of fossils vis-a-vis -vis the share of renewables is not as such influenced um, by the price as a major factor. It is very much influenced uh, by the CO2 emissions of the respective ways of energy and in particular uh, um, electricity production. And at that point, renewables are just un unbeatable, one has to say. And also I would like to add, it is quite clear that um, as long as we don't have a second wave, which I think is not, we cannot, 
seriously exclude that at the moment. Absolutely. I think it's more likely than unlikely increasingly. At least our surveys indicate uh, that there is increasingly a majority expecting a second wave lockdown in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I would, I would actually share that assessment. Um, but as long as that is not clear, it appears the prices, oil and, for, um, oil and gas prices, are also picking up slowly. There was a period in which uh, Germany, uh, 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 as a leader in Europe, uh, made a very big commitment to renewables over the last decade. And the German government did take some uh, heavy criticism about that and structure of that. Do you think this period now is a real a justification of those decisions that were made? Um, I wouldn't see the link between um, um, between this pandemic we right. have and um, energy transition to be right. um, that close. Actually. Okay. I, I do think that there is um, a psychological link being made, um, feeling vulnerable due to global um, um, unsustainable acts, because that is probably at the origin of, of the virus, um, would um, make people more ready to accept restrictions in view of sustainability and resilience, yes, uh, but justification, no. In fact, though, there is no need for justification because um, the German population has been in favor of renewables, strongly in favor of energy transition um, ever since um, the German government decided to drop out of nuclear in 2010. But there was a period where that, as a model, the German example, i.e. the structure of the way the renewables came in, uh, the, the, the rebate and the subsidy and so on, uh, it, it, it took some criticism to be a blueprint for other places when it was such a brave and innovative decision. Uh, I'm, I was sort of thinking more about that okay. particular point. I, um, I thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I think you're right. It was a brave decision and uh, we have been paying um, a rather high p price, still are paying a rather high price for moving from conventional to renewable energy sources, um, around about 26 billion per year, but uh, um, we can manage. Um, Germany being um, a rather wealthy state we can manage and this decision to move forward to, um, as a front runner has um, made renewable energies, technology in renewable energy so much cheaper that nowadays uh, worldwide um, countries with much better weather conditions, but much worse financial conditions, can now invest into renewables and make it a business model. So I think we, we really did a good thing there. Absolutely. I think what it, with coming out of this COVID period, or not coming out of, but coexisting, whatever way, the great disruption it has been, there is a commitment uh, to stimulus spending from different governments. I'm wondering what is your experience in Germany and in Europe that, uh, and would you advocate that this is a window of opportunity to sort of advance the infrastructure spend around the transition and renewables and, and, and not to do so would be a missed opportunity? Oh, absolutely. There are estimations that on a global level about uh, 26 trillion US dollars will be spent on, on stimuli to react, sorry, to react um, to the recession. Um, as far as Germany is concerned, we have decided on a recovery package comprising 130 billion. Um, regarding the European Union, our political leaders are still discussing a package <laughs> fourth day in, um, in a row discussing yes. a package. Seems like they're having a, <laughs> a, a, a fairly robust 
vision for the future of Europe? <laughs> I, I think we are having a very democratic attitude towards opinion building, um, yeah. looking for a consensus uh, yeah. that comprises 27 very, very different yeah. uh, member yeah. states. And I'm very optimistic that in the end we will um, succeed in, in finding a compromise. Um, right now, this green recovery program called Next Generation EU is supposed to comprise uh, 750 billion euro. I would expect it to end up with around about 700, something like that, which still is an enormous sum. And um, both our national program and the European uh, program have a very strong focus on green investments. And that is um, obviously necessary because um, this enormous amount of money about to be stand, uh, spent will shape our infrastructures, our buildings, our energy systems, our transportation for years, decades to come. So it must be green or otherwise uh, we, are, we have lost uh, um, investments which would Is there be any said. debate on that point with, I mean, I know the European leaders are arguing about different issues, but is there consensus around that particular point? There's very much a consensus around that particular point. The next generation EU program shall comprise um, large investments into building efficiency, raising the refurbishment rate from one to three percent. It shall comprise investments into zero emission mobility, uh, it shall boost renewable energy um, and um, it shall also bo um, boost green hydrogen. The amounts to be spent are still subject uh, to discussions, but you know, once the leaders have decided on the package, it will go to the European Parliament. So whatever comes out, the European Parliament is going to assure that it will be greener than what came in, I'm right. very optimistic. By the way, our German package has about 33% of the 130 billion um, dedicated to green investments. So it's almost- Why, why has Germany been uh, so uh, keen on hydrogen? What have you identified that hydrogen is the solution uh, at, and, and particularly at this time, given hydrogen has been around a while, uh, 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 why is Germany moving so robustly forward on the idea of hydrogen? Um, first, I would like to point out that um, we are not alone in that. Um, in fact, um, we are coming in rather late. Uh, for example, as Australia passed its um, hydrogen strategy month before we did as did other countries. Japan has been um, very much into hydrogen even for years. Uh, um, for Germany, it, uh, we used to think that it might not be economical. What we are seeing now are two facts. One is that um, we can use green electricity at times where we produce too much to put it into the production of green hydrogen. You can't store green electricity, but you can wonderfully store hydrogen. So it's a way of making use of electricity that would otherwise be lost. And um, the other aspect is that certain technologies um, you can only green them, certain production, means of production, you can only green them with the help of green hydrogen, such as in particular steel, very important, but also the cement. Also for certain modes of transportation, such as heavy trucks or um, ships, you need hydrogen, you, you wouldn't be able to, or the technology, you wouldn't be able to uh, make them move on a battery. Therefore, um, we see plenty of important aspects for um, using this energy carrier. And what is your vision vis-a-vis uh, -vis what percentage, how quickly does hydrogen come into the German fuel mix? 
Um, right now, we are still talking about um, rather low scale experimental um, um, production um, areas, electrolysis. And I would expect, uh, well, according to, to our strategy, we will have um, five to 10, uh, to 10 gigawatt on the medium term. Uh, um, I would expect that to be also the end of our national production because uh, to produce green hydrogen, you need sun or wind and you need space. We don't have that much sun. Uh, we have a sufficient amount of uh, wind, but we don't have the space uh, to put sufficient windmills up. So what we are expecting to do is to import green hydrogen in the long run. We can export the technology. We are very good in, in producing green hydrogen, but we are not very good in, in the import part. So it could be a win-win situation, for example, with Australia, for example, with uh, Russia even, but also, of course, with the Gulf states, um, if interest be. We would be very open to that. And how would what would that model look like if you say with the Gulf states, for example? Well, the model would um, be the Gulf states. Um, I, I must um, say have um, very good uh, prerequisites in terms of um, um, sun. Yeah. Uh, um, in terms of political stability, wh which is important for long-term investments. Yeah. Uh, um, we may be looking at a pipeline problem uh, because uh, transportation is an additional factor in, in the cost of, of hydrogen yeah. and certain other countries that I named before might be, it might be easier for them to, to get the hydrogen out. Uh, um, but the idea would be that um, we have a cooperation, intergovernmental cooperation, where uh, we can put businesses together, those that could supply the machinery and the investment, those that could supply the demand for the hydrogen, right. and find a local partner that uh, would be A willing. little bit like perhaps the LNG model was previously. Indeed, very, very much actually like, like the LNG model was. And of course you can put, um, you can store hydrogen um, sufficiently to export it either uh, directly by cooling it down or through um, f uh, storing it within fertilizers. So it's, it is possible to move it. It's just expensive. It has its, yeah, well, like I suppose liquefied natural gas was for a long time. Um, just still is bit, actually. Still is, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, in terms of the energy transition, there, there obviously is the energy fuel mix that we've just been talking about, but there's also the consumption and the efficiency and the technology in production and, and, and particularly digital adoption. I'm wondering from your perspective at the German Energy Agency, how important is digital adoption uh, to the energy transition? Well, digitization can um, influence the, the energy transition um, in, in very, very different ways. Um, just to name a couple of examples, maybe. Um, as I um, said before, we in Germany having a share of around about 45, 46% of renewables in our electricity mix uh, um, have a challenge regarding the input of, of fluctuating um, renewable electricity. Uh, um, grids have a limited capacity and that capacity is very much dependent on weather conditions because the hotter a line gets, the less it can transfer. If you can digitalize um, the weather forecasts, link it to the grid operation, at the same time have sensors in the grid to, to see 
how it is warming up, you could use existing grids to a much higher extent uh, than you can um, under norm or under actual circumstances. A very different other example is uh, um, when you have um, electricity, um, infra um, electric mobility infrastructure, then how do you pay for that? You could do that by Bitcoins, for example, blockchain. Mm -hmm. Very easy to, to install, but it needs uh, um, a digitization of, of the whole chain, things like that. One of the big parts of the German energy transition and in Europe as a whole is the move away from coal-fired power yeah. uh, with the replacement mainly by natural gas, which uh, in the context of Europe, well, obviously renewables as well, which you've done an amazing job on, but the also natural gas coming uh, uh, from Russia. My point is coming to the current standoff around Nord Stream 2. Uh, the, the gas coming in from Nord Stream 2 has become a very hot issue. Uh, it's come back onto the headlines in the last week. And probably a good time to take a drink of coffee. But the uh, I'm wondering what's the outlook for that? Uh, how big a deal does it feel like for the German energy sector? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, Sean, you keep asking me that. Whenever we talk, you keep asking me. <laughs> well, it's not a, it's not a, not a minor problem, I suppose. a minor issue, right? There's a no, massive it's gas a, um, pipeline coming from Russia that the U.S. is not happy about. Yeah, indeed, um, it's not happy about, and um, new sanctions are, are waiting, going beyond what has been uh, um, decided some time ago. Um, we now face beyond the ships uh, putting down the lines, uh, sanctions regarding supplier, sanction even regarding um, municipal authorities um, that collaborate in giving permissions. That's a um, not a good situation. Um, Germany and uh, the United States have always been rather close and um, we feel that among friends you don't um, tell them how to um, procure their electricity and in particular you don't force them to do it in a certain way and not do it in, other, in another way. Um, there is no, of course, there is no danger for energy security in, in Germany, even if uh, North Stream 2 shouldn't be built. Uh, um, first of all, um, a considerable amount of that gas would have been or will be imported for export, re-export. And um, secondly, of course, we are part of the European um, Union and, and common energy market. So uh, we can also import from other European countries, for example. Um, however, I do still hope that it will be possible to solve that um, controversy politically, diplomatically, maybe only after the next elections. We'll see. A lot of things might change uh, yes. the, after the next election. But from a German point of view, this project is going ahead, it's going to be completed, uh, 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 and that's the way it is. Well, the German government has always considered it to be um, a project um, which was driven by private companies, okay. private actors. And should um, the companies involve decide to drop out, then... Um, they would drop out. Up to now, we don't have any indications to that effect. Um, also, we hear that, yes, it will take longer to finish the line, but it should remain possible. Uh, um, however, it is not a governmental decision to proceed. Right. Okay. If we might, uh, Christina, just finish up with what we like to call our over-the-horizon uh, uh, crystal ball gazing, you know, if we had sat here a year ago, perhaps 
uh, we had said, well, the big thing over the hill that people aren't paying attention to right now might be hydrogen, right? Hydrogen has suddenly come, although it's been around a while, it's suddenly become very, very hot and very popular. And, uh, uh, and I'm wondering, what do you see over the horizon that might be already in the, in the thinking, but that will become maybe much more pronounced when it comes to the subject of energy transition? Well, one thing that um, I will personally be observing closely are um, energy consumption and in particular mobility habits. I think so much has changed during COVID with people working at home with new digital formats like ours today, uh, um, video conferencing instead of business trips. We have uh, um, people buying bikes all over the place. Um, they used to go by public transportation. Now they go by, by bike. We see that um, people are, yes, they are ordering via e-commerce, but they are also ordering regional products, very conscious of that talking about vulner vulnerability earlier on. And supply chains, uh, even for major enterprises like car Absolute. manufacturers. A absolutely. Um, also, the, um, the perception that um, we might be global partition of labor might be hazardous in a way. Things we have experienced now, like anti antibiotics being produced in China, weren't available due to COVID. So um, I, I would think it might become the new normal, which is still a buzzword, the new normal. We'll see what, what is normal in two years to come. Yes. But it might become the new normal that we have more local production, we have more local recreation, we have less transportation on the roads, less transportation in the air, even on the long run. And that for the climate would be good news because um, around about uh, one third of final energy consumption comes from transportation, uh, 20%. But to achieve that, would you, would, would you agree or what is your opinion on the need to have a price on carbon? Um, oh, very much so. We, we absolutely need a price on carbon. And uh, um, Germany has already introduced um, a system to price carbon outside of the ETS sectors, in particular in transportation. However, um, let's say um, it's a phasing in. So prices will not be rising considerably for, for some time to come. My point is that maybe due to COVID uh, um, habits, humans are creatures of habit and working at home, people start liking it. Not, not all of them all of the time, but much more than before. Video conferencing works. You don't need to travel that much. So my argument is yes, um, CO2 price, wonderful for transportation, but maybe things will change anyhow because of what we are experiencing right now in the transport and in the mobility sector. And I would very much appreciate that. Well, that seems like a, a, a sensible and uh, uh, optimistic place to complete our interview. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Christina Haverkamp, Managing Director of the German Energy Agency, for joining us on the Two Minute Warning feature interview series at Gulf Intelligence. It's been a pleasure. It always is a pleasure to speak with you. You've got very uh, insightful ideas and thoughts, and we do think our stakeholders uh, would very much welcome hearing them. So thank you, Christina, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Sean. I enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> Thank you.